So what is the Fama French three-factor model and its descendants, really? We spend a lot of time deriving factor models and ICAP-M and APT and all this stuff. You didn't see any of those assumptions show up. What is really the nature of this model? Well, let's read what Fama and French have to say about that, uh, which is their comments starting in the section, the case for a multi-factor ICAP-M or APT. Those no, names should be familiar to you now on, on page 76. This is the form of the model. We used to be CAPM. Now we're using Fama and French with perhaps uh, the, the uh, additions of the last 10 years, momentum and, and other things. Does it make sense? Well, the first thing they point out is that the ACID test is whether it can explain differences in average returns, which as we've seen, it does. Another ACID test is, is it useful in applications? Fama and French showed us how the three-factor model encompasses lots of other anomalies. It's useful for that. It's similarly useful for evaluating managers. Uh, if I know that the return of your hedge fund can be explained by these passive portfolios, I don't need to pay you a big fee. I can earn the premiums of these portfolios very cheaply. Now, these may be irrational of themselves, but at least I know how to earn them cheaply. For that practical question, we don't really have to ask deeply where, the, where, the, where it came from. But is it? Uh, what kind of model is it? You can see when you read it, Fama and French are hungry for a deeper explanation, not for simply saying, well, these may be irrational, but therefore the stuff on the left works, but they really want to think of this as a deeper asset pricing model, uh, one that in some sense merits the word explanation rather than just organization of anomalies or, or evaluation of managers. Um, so what do they say about that? Well, uh, at a minimum, they say a minimalist interpretation of the three-factor model is that we have found a parsimonious description of returns and average returns. We looked hard at what those, uh, what those words meant before. Another way of saying it is, well, at least it's an APT. The R squareds are huge, so the assumptions of the APT are satisfied, and the alphas are fairly small, so the results are of the APT ought to be satisfied as well. That's what a parsimonious description means. Going on, uh, the fact that it explains other assets could be that we have stumbled onto portfolios close to MM, three-factor MMV. That's what they say in their last paragraph here. Compared to the theorems that we, we, we ran, we found a theorem that mean variance efficient portfolios generate beta pricing models. But the, this MMV is what they're calling mean variance efficient. They may have just found a bunch of portfolios that are close to mean variance efficient and so generate an asset pricing model. But they're hungry for more. And that's what they go on with. Um, the main reason we do not go beyond this minimalist story is clear. We have not identified state variables of special hedging concern to investors that lead to three-factor pricing. Those are important words. What are they referring to here? They're referring to the theorems that we talked about, uh, the mimicking portfolio theorem. We saw if there's an APT, if there's an ICAP-M, uh, if there's a multi-factor model, then we could always represent those models in terms of those mimicking portfolios. Aha, they would like their HML and SMB to be mimicking portfolios for state variables of concern to investors. Now they think they're out there and lots of subsequent work has tried to link HML to state variables of concern to investors. And they tell a beautiful story. That's on the next page, page 77. Why is relative distress, their story for value, a variable of special hedging concern to investors? And they tell the story of an investor who worries about losing his job and, lo and therefore his human capital not being worth much on the market. And if most, most people have jobs in value companies, then they will shun value stocks and that will lead to the value premium. That's at least a story that they're telling, that the HML is not itself uh, just something arbitrary. The HML is in fact the mimicking portfolio for, for a rational model uh, one of the, of the multi-factor model with outside income variety, and they'd like to characterize it that way. Of course, that, that's a story. One needs to prove that, and a lot of work has gone into, a lot of, uh, gone into trying to do that. 
The point of all this is, of course, why is the HML premium what it is? Given HML, we find the other things, but the point is why is the HML premium what it is? We need to understand that eventually to call this a deeper explanation. Another reason why they're after this is the whole rules of the game question. You know you can fish around and find a mean variance efficient portfolio, so the rules of the game that they're playing by emphasize trying to find factors that make uh, sense. So, uh, for example, why is it that Fama and French are so reluctant to call momentum a factor? If you were just after explanations, you would have gotten to their momentum table and said, oh, oh well, not working, we'll add momentum in the right-hand variable, that's a factor too. Well, Fama and French could tell this story about HML, but stories like that about momentum are so hard to come up with. Why should investors shun stocks that went up last year and are going to go up a little bit more next year? What's the real rational? It's very hard to find a story for that. Fahm and French want to avoid just fishing around and finding things that seem to work. They want to avoid just finding mean variance efficient models. Final thoughts. What does this style of model accomplish for us? Why is it so popular? Um, what does it do for us? First of all, is it organizes anomalies. It's, it's like a taxonomy. It's, it's like Linnaeus putting, uh, putting, putting species into, into violet. It tells us that a large range of apparent anomalies are really only three things, which might be rational, or they might be a smaller category of anomalies. It does a great data reduction for us. It tells us that there's only three or four different kinds of premiums, not one anymore, but three or four kinds of premium uh, out there, and, but they come in many guises. Um, that is a very useful thing for, our, for our, our organization of our work as academics and, and, and practitioners. It means that theory only needs to explain the factor premiums. We, a theoretical model doesn't have to explain all 25 portfolios. It only needs to explain the market, HML, and SMB. And then the Fama French model says, look, once you've done that, all this other stuff follows. That's a lesson that is forgotten. <laughs> Many, many uh, theoretical models then are tested on the 25 portfolios, but the whole point of Fama and French is you don't have to do that. We only have to understand these factor premiums. Given the factor premiums, all the anomalies fall into place. That's a, at least a simplification that makes our job easier going forward. A final rule of the game, one of the most important. We could summarize Fama and French's Table 1A by the observation that expected returns are higher with small socks and book to market stocks. Is it legitimate to say that the Fama French model says that small and value stocks get higher returns than other stocks? Absolutely no. That, and, and there's a bunch of words that help guide us through this puzzle. This is true. It is true that small stocks and value stocks get higher returns, but that is not the Fama French model. That is a description of reality. It's not an expla explanation of reality. Small and value are characteristics of companies. They are not betas. The rules of explanation say what goes on the right-hand side has to be at least a regression coefficient of some sort. That, no matter how big the factor zoo goes, that rule is inviolate. It says that you get an expected return for who you are. I'm sorry, not for who you are, but for how you behave. Who you are is whether you're small or big, but what should drive expected returns is how you behave, what your betas are. A small company that behaves like a big company, a small company with a very low beta ought to get a low expected return even though it is small. If not, you could make a fortune. If this were the, the, the explanation of reality, just find small companies uh, that have low betas and you'll make a fortune with them. Explanations must have betas, and therefore you can't exploit this structure to make a fortune. That's the whole point of, of we found an explanation. So the, the big rule of the game is <laughs> this is a description of reality. To call it an explanation, the thing on the right-hand side must be regression coefficients. Still, the question is, what kinds of things do you run the regressions on? And that comes down to what you're going to use the model for. And you've seen how Fahm and French use their model.